All right. A big thank you to everybody who's logging on and joining us. So nice to see some familiar names popping on. We've just uh, asked a poll question. So if you're just logging on, you can look at the bottom of your screen and see that little polling icon. Do you believe in Bigfoot? Right now, we've got about 43% of people saying yes, 21 saying no, and 36% undecided. Right next to that polling icon or just a couple of over, you'll see a little Q&A icon. So please know that as we go through this webinar, you can use that icon and ask us some questions. We're gonna give it just about two more minutes to see if anybody else logs on and then we'll get going. For those just joining us, at the bottom of your screen, we're asking a poll. Do you believe in Bigfoot? The majority of people have answered. Right now, 50% are undecided. 33% do believe in Bigfoot, with 17% giving it a solid no. Thank you for joining us for our Lost Lineages webinar this evening. You might notice that you do not have a microphone or a video, but if you look at the bottom of your screen, you can use that little Q&A icon anytime throughout the webinar to send us a question. This is the first of our series of webinars, and we're so happy that our very own Fred Rubio will be joining us today. Fred is one of our caregivers here at Project Chimps, and he serves as the Science Committee Facilitator. He studied in the Primate Behavior Graduate Program at Central Washington University, where his thesis research interests focused on cognitive enrichment and its efficacy for the chimpanzees at Project Chimps. So without further ado, take it away, Fred. All right, thanks for that intro, Megan. And uh, thank you for everyone joining us uh, to hear this webinar. Um, it's going to be a little bit quirky, but we're going to learn a lot. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about all of these ancient primates, chimps, and Bigfoot. Um, I love talking about this kind of thing, so I'm really excited to get started. So um, everyone knows about Bigfoot. Bigfoot is uh, one of probably the most famous cryptids uh, in the world, if not only the United States of America. So uh, obviously, we don't know too much about Bigfoot, though. So um, we kind of have to, we're, we're obviously going to say that Bigfoot is a primate, uh, just based on general characteristics. Um, and then here are some very specific details about Bigfoot. Um, most stories put it at over eight feet tall. Uh, it is a bipedal ape. That's a really big deal. Um, it seems to be solitary. Most photographs that we have like this one here indicate that it is normally by itself. It's not a social animal. Um, and then we also have uh, details of mysterious calls in the woods that cannot be explained. So with that um, with being attributed to Bigfoot, we can also say that Bigfoot is vocal. Um, and then the way that we're able to determine that Bigfoot is an ape uh, compared to other primates is the fact that it doesn't have a tail. So it is tailless. So these are all really crucial details in trying to pinpoint what exactly Bigfoot is. And it'll all come back later once we go over the different families of primates that are and extinct. So 
The problem with Bigfoot uh, currently is that there are no other examples of living primates in North America. So we do have uh, monkeys in South America that go as far up as into Central America. But past that point, you don't have any monkeys or apes or any other form of primate that are native to America, North America that weren't brought in for zoo purposes or what have you. So our challenge is to say, what is Bigfoot? We need to be able to place it in the phylogeny of all of the primates that exist. And then we also need to answer the question, how did it get here? So those are things that we're going to go over over this webinar. So the first hypothesis that we can uh, go over uh, when trying to explain Bigfoot is whether or not Bigfoot has just been in North America since the dawn of time, since before humans even got here. So in order for that to occur, Bigfoot would have needed to have evolved from primates that lived in North America. And believe it or not, we did have at one point in time, primates living in North America. And those were the Omamias. Uh, this was a really broad group of primates along with the Adapids. They were spread out all over the place. They weren't just in America. They were also found in Europe and Asia. And they lived a long time ago. This is in the range of 54 to 34 million years ago. So this is um, not a recent thing. They were really small bodied um, as we've seen from fossil evidence. And we are able to hypothesize that they were nocturnal. And this is just going off of their orbit size. So if you look at our figure looking at their skull, you can see that the hole where their eyes are is extremely large. So generally when animals have larger eyes, it is because they need to be able to see in poorly lit conditions. So when is light at its worst? During the nighttime. So with that, we are able to attribute uh, nocturnality to the Alamiads, which uh, based, to, based on uh, some reports, people presume Bigfoot is mostly nocturnal. So that is a characteristic that Bigfoot would share with this group of primates. Um, the only problem though, is that, like I mentioned before, these are really small primates. They're actually similar uh, to modern primates, the tarsiers and the bush babies, uh, also known as galagos. Uh, tarsiers are the only exclusively carnivorous primate in the world, and they're this big. They eat insects only, they hunt at night, and they are really excellent jumpers, and they have extremely large eyes, just like the omamiads. Uh, bush babies are also primarily nocturnal, but they have a really broad diet, so they eat all sorts of things. Um, those two primates, though, they're more of old world species. You'll find them in Africa and Asia. So they're not any way related to the Omamids. So uh, unfortunately, this group of primates, because they are so small and because they are so old and because they are extinct, uh, the link between them and Bigfoot is tenuous. So unfortunately, uh, we have to rule out the Omamids being the uh, root uh, ancestral species that just blossomed into Bigfoot. So we have to look further on into another group of primates. So because those last primates were too small, which primates were actually big enough to have possibly um, been related to Bigfoot? So you can argue that perhaps that smaller species evolved over time into a larger species, but because there's such a large gap in time, 34 million years and no fossil evidence, you can't establish a connection between the Omamids and Bigfoot. Unfortunately, fossils don't form uh, readily. You have to have really specific conditions in sediments and weather and all sorts of other things in order for a fossil to form. And unfortunately, you don't find them all the time. And over 34 million years, if you don't find a fossil within that time, it probably doesn't exist. So that's how we rule out the Amamids and we move on. So another group of primates that we come to uh, includes this extinct species, the Archaeoindries. So this is one of the giant sloth lemurs of Madagascar. If you're unfamiliar with Madagascar, it is the large island to the east of uh, Africa. It's got a very popular movie named after it. It's a really large island. And if you're familiar with lemurs, they're typically the size of a cat. So when you come to archaeo injuries, which weighed maybe more than 350 pounds, you suddenly realize this is a very atypical primate that is about the size of a gorilla. So that's a really big deal that at one point in time, there was a lemur that was as big as a gorilla. So uh, there isn't a whole uh, lot of evidence that we found of archaeo injuries, but as you can see, we do have a rather complete skull. 
And that's how we're able to project its overall size based off of that skull. So uh, one thing that could be in favor for this being a Bigfoot ancestor is that it could have been alive as recently as 350 BCE. So that's really not all that long ago. That's only a few thousand years. And um, so, you know, Bigfoot is current, Archaeo injuries is not, um, but you know, over a few thousand years, that's really not all that much in the geological time scale. Uh, difference though, that will make Archaeo injuries a less likely contender to be a Bigfoot ancestor is the fact that it's quadrupedal. It does not walk on two legs bipedally like Bigfoot or, or human beings do. And even though we don't have a complete skeleton of Archaeo injuries, we're able to determine that it was quadrupedal based on its relatives, the lemurs, which are quadrupedal, but also by the skull. So our skull uh, that we have here as an example, the opening in the back of the skull where the spinal cord comes through is off of the back. Uh, which means that the animal was having this orientation as it walked. For bipedal creatures like you and me, uh, the opening for our uh, spinal cord is actually coming up from the bottom. So based off of that orientation, we're able to say conclusively, even though we do not have a complete skeleton, that archaeo injuries was quadrupedal and probably not a really uh, good example of a possible ancestor. So once again, we have to rule out this group of primates. Um, another limit too is the fact that this is Madagascar, it's an island. Uh, it would be kind of uh, tenuous to say that archaeo injuries migrated from Madagascar to Africa and then to North America sometime, somehow over the last 3000 years. That's a really big jump to take. So now we come to the likely contender of where Bigfoot belongs. This is the hominids. This is all apes and humans and human ancestors. So this will include uh, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, uh, humans, Neanderthals, you name it. So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of key characteristics of Bigfoot that suggest that it is an ape. And so now we're coming to the group that if it were to belong to anyone, it would belong to. So this is a really cool graphic. I really like this. It just gives you kind of side by side comparison of a few of our apes. Uh, there are actually a lot more species than are depicted here. You have several species of gorillas. You have several species of orangutans and many subspecies of chimpanzees. So what's great about this uh, graphic though, is that you see that of all of these apes, there is only one that is bipedal and that, are, that is the human being. So all the other apes are capable of walking bipedally. You, you do see chimps walk bipedally all the time. You see gorillas and uh, bonobos and orangutans walk bipedally all the time, but they're not built for that. Uh, it is really uncomfortable for, for them to do that. Uh, their pelvis is angled in such a way, their spine is shaped in such a way that walking upright just isn't comfortable. They'd be as comfortable doing bipedal locomotion as you or I would be to walk on all fours. So we can do it. We're just not going to do it because it's not comfortable. So that kind of precludes those species, but evolution's a thing. And it is possible that you have offshoots that evolve bipedal locomotion. Um, our knowledge actually suggests that the ancestor for humans, gorillas, chimps, and that whole lineage with bonobos, uh, they were bipedal. And then gorillas, bonobos, chimps, they all evolved quadrupedal locomotion afterwards. So uh, it goes back and forth, it's never stagnant. Uh, another key detail um, when we're talking about Bigfoot is just the shape of its foot. So this is a casting of a Bigfoot track. Uh, this is obviously one of the uh, most numerous forms of evidence that we have of Bigfoot. Uh, this is the Hereford, Hereford Bigfoot uh, casting. Um, this was a photo taken at the Expedition Bigfoot uh, Museum in Cherry Lock. And when you look at this foot, it's gonna look a lot like yours and mine. You're gonna have a hard time, you know, saying that it isn't a human-like foot just based on the position of the toes and also just the overall length of the foot. So really important thing to take note of. Uh, there are other uh, castings that have been taken that show different morphologies, but this specific type of casting is the most popular one. You'll see the most common one you'll see. So, talk about chimps. 
we share 98% DNA with them. And uh, if we're going to discuss possible roots, uh, we can't exclude them. So chimps are native to equatorial Africa. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have four subspecies of chimps. And as you go across the midsection of Africa along the equator, you're going to find chimps pretty much almost everywhere along that line. And uh, with those four subspecies, you have subgroups, you have uh, cultures. There are so many individual groups of chimps, so many different tribes of chimps that have their own unique ways of doing things, of living and persisting and just getting food. So they're very diverse and they're very cultural. And as I mentioned before, they're capable of bipedal locomotion. Um, a characteristic they share with Bigfoot is their pan hoot, pan hoot contact call. So contact calls are actually really common among primates and uh, they are what their name suggests they're for making contact. So even when you have solitary species or really predominantly solitary species like the orangutan, you need a way of finding others or letting others know where you are. And that's, when, that's why we have contact calls. You need to be able to tell possible competitors where you are so that they stay away and avoid you. And you also need to let potential mates where you are so that they can come and find you. So that is the purpose of a contact call for a solitary species like the orangutan and Bigfoot. And in terms of chimps, uh, they actually use it because they splinter off into subgroups. So you do have a big core group of chimps that live together. They're very social. They can live in very large groups. Some have documented maybe around 200 in the wild, but they don't spend 24 seven with each other. They splinter off, they have small groups, uh, but as they splinter off to forage, they need to be able to find each other again later. So that's where the contact call comes into play. Uh, so that's what they do uh, in order to find each other uh, later on. Uh, a downside of uh, chimps being linked to Bigfoot is that they're actually not all that tall. So uh, you will have chimps that can outweigh the average human being. We have a couple who are pretty big here, uh, but for the most part, even when they're standing on their back legs, they are going to be shorter than human beings and not taller. So that kind of discredits the connection between them and Bigfoot. Um, another thing being based on this graphic that we have here, the just shape of the foot uh, does not match uh, typical Bigfoot castings. Uh, chimps are what we call quadrumanus. So that means that each of their extremities end in a hand-like appendage. So they have hands four feet. They don't have that flat foot with the toes on one end like we do. Um, that's so that they can climb trees. They need to be able to grip really well. So having four hands instead of two is a huge advantage to do that. So unfortunately, we have to exclude chimps uh, with that connection to Bigfoot. So now we move on to the most Bigfoot-like primate that has ever lived. This is a real uh, primate that lived. It was called Gigantopithecus. And estimates uh, place it between 2 million years and 300,000 years ago. Uh, it is estimated to weigh between 440 and 660 pounds. But because we don't have all that much fossil evidence of it, there are some estimates that say that it was maybe even 1,200 pounds. So this was a ginormous ape. Uh, the estimates we have place it around 10 feet tall, about three meters. It was found in Southeast Asia, so Vietnam and Southern China, and it was related to the orangutan. Um, we only discovered this species in 1935 when an anthropologist was going through uh, Chinese medicinal shops and found a molar on the shelf that he knew was definitively primate, just based on its uh, cusps and just general morphology. He knew it was a primate molar and it was huge. And he knew it was, he knew it was really um, important as soon as he found it. And it sparked all sorts of searches and the first places they looked at were Chinese medicinal shops. But over time, we started exploring caves. And since then, we found thousands of these teeth. Uh, fortunately, we've also found four incomplete craniums, uh, skulls. And with that, we were able to actually say that, yes, this was a ape and it was huge. And this, these were its teeth. So unfortunately, though, we don't have complete skeletons. So a lot of uh, the sizes are based on estimates, just doing proportions based on the tooth, based on the skull size and comparing it to other living apes, uh, just doing that exponential growth based on that size. So this species is extinct. It no longer exists. 
And we believe that it may have died out uh, because it was such a specialized eater. Um, based on the thickness of the enamel on its teeth, we think that it ate a lot of bamboo, just like pandas. Uh, when you have really thick enamel, you eat really dense, really hard to process foods. Uh, so because bamboo is in such abundance uh, and you can eat it nonstop all day, it's more than likely that that's what Gigantopithecus ate. Uh, the problem is if conditions ever change for a specialized eater, you're going to be in trouble. You don't have a broad, diverse diet. So if you have a bad year for bamboo, you're going to have a bad year in general. So we believe as uh, the climate changed over time, uh, bamboo may have uh, recessed and Gigantopithecus found that it didn't have anything to eat anymore. And that's how it uh, became eliminated. So unfortunately, it is no longer an existing species of primate, but it is one of the absolute coolest. So let's just hypothesize of like how Bigfoot could have come to North America since we don't have any North American primates living there natively currently. So uh, we've heard of the Bering Strait. Uh, it's a very popular migration route that a lot of animals took during the last um, ice age, human beings included. So the Bering Strait is actually a ice land bridge that occurred over the last ice age that connected Russia to Alaska. And so uh, the leading hypothesis for human migration was that you had uh, migratory uh, species moving across that land bridge and human beings just followed. So it's really not off the wall to presume, to you know, hypothetically think that a ape species could have done the same thing because human beings did that same route. All sorts of host stock did that same route. Um, so it's really not that absurd to think that uh, a population of large ape that was living in Asia took that same route over time. Maybe it was different from all of the Gigantopithecus uh, remains that we found. Maybe it had a broader diet. Maybe it wasn't quite so large uh, and maybe it adapted as it traveled. So it seems like kind of a crazy route to take, but in primatology, it actually isn't the craziest migration that we've ever heard of. Uh, monkeys in South America was actually a bit of a mystery to primatologists for a very long time. The, the existence of monkeys in South America is actually more recent than the split of South America from Africa. So the monkeys that came there literally crossed an ocean to get there. And the leading uh, idea behind how they did that was that you have estuaries in which uh, masses of vegetation grow and actually break off and they form rafts. So it's, uh, the idea is that there was a group of monkeys that formed the population on one of these rafts and sailed essentially from Africa to South America. And it's really not off the wall to think of when you realize that wind currents and ocean currents are actually favorable toward that direction. And seven million years ago when monkeys first came there, the distance between Africa and South America was a lot smaller than it is right now. So they wouldn't have had that much of a journey to, to do that. So if monkeys can do that, uh, it's, really not, it's really not crazy to think that an ape could walk across ice. So it's, uh, it's not a bad idea. So um, we may have more questions now than we did at the beginning of what is Bigfoot and where did it come from? And we may not actually have any satisfying answers uh, until we have those fossils, until we have those biological samples to go off of. But science being what it is, you can never deny possibility. You have to uh, have a hypothesis test it with evidence, and then you can draw your conclusions. But as it stands, we have you know, some examples of evidence. They're not completely convincing yet until we have those bi biological samples, but we cannot deny the existence of something based on the lack of evidence. So does Bigfoot exist? That's just something I'm gonna have to leave up to you. And with that, uh, the webinar uh, presentation is over and we're ready to do Q&A. Awesome, thank you, Fred. The first question coming in is, how long could a chimp walk on two feet at one time? It's really up to them. Um, they can do it as long as they want to. So if a chimp suddenly decided that they wanted to walk like this nonstop day in and day out, they would do it, um, but they're not going to do it. Uh, they're not comfortable doing it. Uh, the longest I've seen one do it would be maybe 
could be 10 seconds tops experience. Um, there are, we do have a couple of chimps who involved, who were involved in bipedal locomotion studies and uh, they were subject to that uh, pretty regularly. So I'm sure they could do it a long, much longer time period than uh, your average chimp would do. But typically, yeah, 10 seconds, that's about as long as they're comfortable doing it, I think. Awesome, thank you. What about the Yeti or abominable snowman? Could it be a giganto? That is a really, um, really much more reasonable idea. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, Gigantopithecus isn't actually just a species, it's a genus, which means that we have several species uh, that fall under that classification. And we do have evidence of a smaller version of the one I was mentioning uh, that did live near the Himalayas. So, I mean, what, what better connection could you ask for? You had a smaller version of that ape species that lived at the base of the mountain in which yetis are um, hypothesized to have been found. So as far as connections go, that's the best connection you could possibly ask for. Um, yes, absolutely. Awesome. If non-human primates do exist in North America, where do you believe they could best thrive and what would their diet consist of? So uh, monkeys uh, typically like jungle type areas. Um, you do have uh, monkeys subsisting everywhere. There's, there's definitely exceptions, but heavily wooded areas are where it's at because uh, monkeys specifically do have pretty generalized diets. They'll eat what they can find. So you can find a, lots, a lot of different kinds of stuff uh, inside wooded areas. Um, there is actually a wild uh, population of monkeys in Florida uh, that live in the Everglades, I believe. I believe they are uh, Langer species. Uh, they were introduced to an island on a river uh, as part of a river tour in 1912. And the man who introduced them there did not realize that Langers can swim and they ended up going into the mainland and their population has exploded. So there are hundreds of non-native monkeys living in Florida and they're doing just fine. So uh, yeah, anywhere in the US that you can find heavily wooded areas like that, uh, you can find monkeys. Wow. Um, do chimps eat bamboo? They do. Uh, we actually provide bamboo to our chimps here at Project Chimps as part of our brows, which is just uh, vegetation that we grow and give to them so that they can chew on it. Uh, they really love uh, thick uh, bamboo stalks. Um, it's really fun for them to chew on. They have a habit to want to destroy things and bamboo is really satisfying to destroy just the way it splinters as you chew it. So they'll, um, they'll break that apart. Uh, they'll make it into nice little fibers and then they'll do what we call wadging where they just make it into as tight of a ball as they can uh, in their mouth and they basically chew on it like chewing gum and they like to drink water with it so that they can kind of suck all of the nutrients out of that wadge. So yes, chimps love bamboo and we give it to them all the time here. Now you've stated that we can't deny the existence of Bigfoot. So do you believe Bigfoot exists? Uh, I personally do not. Uh, I would like to see a, a little bit more evidence. I would like to see some actual biological samples that don't fit into any other primate um, group that we've ever seen. So if we found, for example, hair or feces or actual remains, and we did DNA sequencing on them that placed them somewhere in that hominid group that I was talking about, but did not actually match any examples of those hominids, then I would say hands down, without a doubt, this is a Bigfoot and Bigfoot uh, does exist. So until that time, uh, I'm just going to sit on the fence about it. Nice. Is the Billy Ape real? So yeah, the Billy Ape is really interesting. Um, it's, it's almost a legend in and of itself. It's uh, more than likely just, it's just a subspecies of chimp that just happens to be really, really big. And uh, with that, there have come some stories that it is especially violent. Um, there really isn't a lot of information about the Billy Ape. Uh, there are some photographs of the Billy Ape uh, and it is huge. It is absolutely larger than your average chimp. So um, there, there, have been, there have been a few scientists who've gone out to explore it, but really there isn't a lot of substantial data on it just yet. So we really can't say too much about it at this point in time. Next question. 
could Bigfoot be like a feral chimp, like a stray pet? Uh, possibly. I mean, uh, that would make sense really to me. Um, there are, you know, lots of sightings that people have of having seen Bigfoot. And uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of individuals in the United States who think having a chimp is, uh, as a pet is a good idea. Uh, it is not. Uh, so it's not really, uh, it's not really off the wall to assume that one could get out and just cause havoc and have flirting glances from a couple of spectators that people interpret as being Bigfoot. So uh, yeah, I, you could say that um, a, a few sightings anyway could have been that exact situation. Um, a lot of people would say though that black bears are probably the most common sighting of Bigfoot that people are seeing. Awesome, thanks friend. And we're getting some great questions. I'm assuming everyone's found the Q&A icon. Just in case, if you have a question, you can just go to the bottom of your screen, click on that little Q&A icon and go ahead and send your question in. Um, and we still have a couple more, Fred. So next one, if Bigfoot exists, how does it breed? Photos of Bigfoot are mo mostly of males. Where are the females and the children? Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, there are a lot of parallels between Bigfoot and orangutans uh, because they are so solitary. So like I said before, you only ever really see pictures of just one Bigfoot at a time. They're not a group of big, foot, big feet, uh, Bigfoots, whatever you would call them. Uh, so uh, male orangutans are, um, they, they tend to have core areas and then females kind of tend to bounce around. So um, it is it is kind of hard. That, that is another problem. Uh, we're not seeing uh, females, right? Uh, but it's not, if we we're going to hypothesize, we could say that females maybe are a little more sedentary. Maybe they spend more time in any given area, wh whatever they're doing, foraging. Um, maybe, maybe they uh, stay in dens like bears do, especially if they have young. Maybe that's why you never see pictures of Bigfoot young because the mothers are protective of them. They don't let them leave the den perhaps until they're ready to leave. Um, orangutans, the, the children do not leave the mother for at least eight years, if not longer. They, they learn from their mother. They have to be able to acquire life skills in order to survive. Uh, so uh, that could explain why you don't see females, why you don't see infants and children, just because they, they're a little more protective. Um, maybe we see more pictures of males because they arrange more Maybe they are looking for more females. Uh, maybe the females are hard to find, so they have to range more in order to find them. So that could be a hypothetical explanation uh, why we don't see those. Awesome. Next question. There have been hundreds of sightings of Bigfoot according to the museum. What are people seeing? And if they exist presently, wouldn't there be skeletal evidence of them? So uh, as I said before, uh, a lot of people are suggesting that sightings of Bigfoot are probably more than likely just uh, black bear sightings. So black bears uh, are quadrupedal animals, but you will see them stand on their hind legs and walk bipedally from time to time. So if you are only seeing them at a glance, if you're seeing them through heavy uh, brush, uh, it will be really easy to interpret that black bear as an upright ape because it is bipedal. Uh, so yeah, that, that is more than likely what we're seeing. And I'm sorry, Megan, could you repeat the second half of the question? Uh, I've already forgotten that part of it. If they exist presently, wouldn't there be skeletal evidence skeletal of them? Skeletal remains, right. So, uh, a, an explanation that I have heard, um, that, uh, would be kind of hard to substantiate is, uh, the claim that, uh, Bigfoot is actually uh, participating in ceremonial burials. So uh, that is an idea that I've heard that, um, that Bigfoot maybe does have strong family units that they create um, uh, graves uh, for their deceased and that they bury them afterwards. So that would be a really big deal because that is obviously a very cultural thing. Uh, it implies uh, spirituality. So uh, if Bigfoot were real and if Bigfoot were participating in that, that is um, huge. That would, that would basically be attributing, you know, 
Bigfoot because uh, it's a complex uh, behavior that goes beyond, you know, just survival. It goes to, you know, spirituality and uh, empathy. So uh, not sure if I've seen anything that would suggest that that is actually happening, but that is the explanation that has been uh, explained to me. Great. This next one is asking about what is the difference between a chimp's digestive system and a human? And do we do you feed the chimpanzees meat from time to time? So I don't actually have details on how our digestive systems uh, compare or contrast, but uh, just going off of the fact that we share 98% DNA, it's a really solid bet that you can say we share um, really similar digestive tracts. Uh, chimpanzees in the wild are opportun opportunistic omnivores. So they will eat anything and everything. It's vegetables, uh, roots, fruits, uh, insects, bugs, um, honey, and even uh, meat. So we do have uh, documentation of chimps hunting even monkeys. They'll hunt red colobus monkeys. And there's actually some information suggesting that uh, the chimpanzees who hunt red colobus monkeys are hunting them so well that they're hunting them to extinction. So that's how good of a hunter a chimp can be uh, when it has access to those monkeys. Uh, other chimps actually participate in spear hunting. So you have Fongoli chimps that process sticks into spears. They actually chew the ends of sticks into sharp pointed objects. And then they go and hunt those bush babies and galagos that we were talking about earlier. Uh, they are nocturnal, which means they sleep during the day. They sleep in little hollows and trees and chimps will find them exactly that way. They'll just stick a sharp stick into those holes and that's how they get those meals. Uh, here at Project Chimps, we're a vegan sanctuary. So we don't feed them any kind of uh, meats uh, but we still make sure that they're getting their vitamins, uh, their essential vitamins and proteins. We have a primate chow diet that we feed them that has every vitamin they could possibly need. And we give them all sorts of protein laced uh, scatter objects like, like beans and foods of that nature. So we make sure that they get those proteins because we know that it is such an essential part of their diet. Uh, having come from an omnivorous species, we need to address that. So that's how they get those dietary um, needs met. Great. Last question. Do chimpanzees and gorillas come into contact in the wild? Oh, absolutely. Yes, uh, they do. And you would think there'd be a lot of tension between them. Uh, but from what I've heard, uh, they typically tend to avoid each other. Uh, they might have, you know, standoffs and hubbubs. But for the most part, they leave each other alone. And I believe this might be an anecdote, but I believe there is a story of a fig tree, uh, which was in a shared range between gorillas and orangutans, and orangutans uh, chimpanzees. And uh, you did have uh, gorillas foraging figs while chimps were also foraging the same figs off the same tree at the same time. So just the picture-esque example of harmony between two ape species and um, supposedly they were not having any issues whatsoever. They are perfectly happy sharing all of the figs off that same tree. Wow, that's fascinating. And this presentation has just been wonderful, Fred. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, teach us all of this this evening and to all of our participants thank you so much for taking the time in your evening to join us for this webinar um, if you have any other questions that you think of you can always send them in to events at projectchimps.org and otherwise you can mark your calendars that we will be doing another webinar on december 17th at 5 p.m with caregiver tanya williams and she will be talking to us about chimpanzee behavior until then, hope you guys all have a great evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you everybody for listening in. And I was really pleased to tell you about, all about this.